Amen. So this morning, we are coming near the end of our summer, summer series. And the summer, summer series, if those of you who haven't been here, uh, we're just focusing on things that during the summer that uh, we can account for in scripture and just brings to life uh, those stories. So it's kind of a loosely based theme. Uh, so if you haven't been here for other ones, don't worry, you're, you're not missing part eight of a intertwined series. This morning we're going to be looking at um, making tracks from the farm. <laughs> and we're looking at Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Now I have it printed for you in your bulletin, for those of you that got a bulletin. But uh, for those of you that didn't, and for those of you at, online or at home, it's in Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. And I'll ask permission of the congregation. Would you like me to read it? Okay, good. Hang on, here we go. So Jesus continued as he was telling these parables and he continued, he said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Luke 15 uh, tells a story of uh, a, a powerful story. There's actually three of them, back to back to back. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And the very beginning of Luke chapter 15, we see that he had gathered together, Jesus had gathered together sinners and tax collectors. And he began to explain to them uh, these three parables. So this is his audience. It's always important to know who your audience is. And for Jesus' audience, this was the, uh, the tax collectors and the sinners. This wasn't amongst the Pharisees, and this wasn't even amongst the disciples. These were people that um, did not know uh, much about what Jesus was stood for or what the kingdom of God was about. And they certainly weren't in opposition to it, as often he ran into with the Pharisees. So I believe that this parable that Jesus teaches, one of his most uh, remembered parables, is a great teaching about the gospel. And I think it's a powerful description of the gospel. If you want to share with someone a little bit about who Jesus is and, and what is the gospel, you wouldn't hurt yourself by going to Luke 15 and have someone read that on their own or read that with them. See, it starts on the farm where there's a fairly stable home life. We're told that there is a father and two sons. And the youngest son uh, wanted to get the next train out of town. <laughs> he wanted out of there. Uh, and so he went to his father and he asked his father for his share of the inheritance. 
I want to ask you here, how many of you have a will that has beneficiaries? Okay. If you had to now pay that beneficiary what you have laid out in your will, how many of you could afford that right now? Right? You, you, you can't. Think about that for this farmer, this man that owns the farm. Think about how much that would have cost him, how much that would have impeded not only his life, but the farm life in order for him to come up with that kind of cash to give to his son. We ever think about that? It wasn't just the father said, oh, okay, and he easily went off and, and grabbed that amount and put it to him. It's not like the father was a, a billionaire. He, he was working a field. He had hired help. He was, uh, he, was in a, he was in a position that his children had to work the farm. So it doesn't sound like uh, he had an immense amount of wealth. But the problem was is that the son didn't care about that. The son just cared about his own needs. And he didn't see how much it cost his father. Or worse, he did, and he didn't care. And so this young man came, and he asked for it, and the father, beyond all measure, went out and did exactly what the son asked. He went and found the amount that would be equal to his inheritance, and put it at the son's uh, disposal. The parable that we see throughout here is a description of God and his children, and the, the father being uh, a representation of our heavenly father, and the children being his children. And he gave his child the opportunity to go and take the wealth and live however. God allows his children to walk away. God allows his children to go. Scriptures actually tell of us, all of us like sheep have gone astray. When you read through the prodigal son, if you don't see yourself in the prodigal son's shoes, you haven't fully integrated the gospel and understood the gospel personally in your life. All of us have been this young man. And the story goes on to say that the, the young man goes off and he goes into the city and basically um, he had a good time while the money lasted. The truth is that bait tastes good. That's why it's called bait. But bait always has a hook attached to it. And the bait tastes good until you catch the hook. And when you catch the hook, when the hook strikes, you know you are trapped. And it feels horrible. Do you know I was working this through and, and I came to the realization that many times when we say we have dreams, what we're actually saying is we have lust but we're going to call them dreams. That way, people uh, won't be upset because, oh, I have a dream. And if you actually break down your dream of what you want to do, keep breaking it down and pull off the polish of it and see what is it. There, like, is it a lust for money? Is it, is it a lust to, to live wildly? Is it a lust for attention? Like, what is it you're really after? Is that a dream? Or is it a lust? And if it's a lust, not only will you fall for it and nothing will keep you from it, but also you can be sure there is a tempter waiting to tempt you with a little bit of bait. And quickly, freedom becomes imprisonment. One of the great theologians, Johnny Cash, um, wrote a song called uh, Folsom Prison Blues. Any of you that are Johnny Cash fans have probably heard that song. I heard the train a-coming. <laughs> That's all you're getting. Um, and it said, and one of his lines is, when I hear the whistle blowing, I hang my head and cry. 
because he's in a prison. And he's in a prison because his mama told him to live right, but he said he shot a man in Reno just to watch him die, and now he's in prison. <laughs> and every time he hears that whistle blowing, he hangs his head and cries because he realizes he is now paying for the consequences of his actions. Something that he thought would be really cool, watching a man die, has left him with the consequences of being trapped in a prison. And he wishes he could go, he wishes he could go back. He hears the whistle blowing and he cries, wishing it was different. So this young man now has a problem on his hands. The money's run out, the wild living's run out. He's gone from being living high on the hog to feeding the hogs. He is now in a position where he can't even get enough to eat. He's got poverty, he's got pride, uh, has been broken, he's ashamed, he's aware, he's fearful, and he's desperate. And in all of these situations, thoughts that would never cross his mind before start to cross his mind. Because I can imagine when he left that farm, he said, bye-bye. You're never going to see me back here again. I don't want to be here anymore. It's time for me to chart my own life. And then when he charts his life and he finds out how miserable the future is going to be, how short it is, he may even starve to death, he starts thinking through and he starts to realize, you know what, life back there really wasn't that bad at all. But I wouldn't be welcome back. I can't come back. You know what? The best thing I can do is I can try and earn it. Maybe I could just earn my way back and never be in a, the same relationship with my father, but maybe I can earn it back. Maybe if I work hard like one of his workers, maybe then he could just let me be like on the border. Maybe I could just get enough to eat. Maybe I could just have enough. Just, just be on, on the outskirts. Maybe. Maybe I could do that. I'll, I'll, I will sell myself to my father as being, just consider me a slave. And so he thinks through, maybe I could go back. But I know I will be going back different, and I know it will all be different when I go back. Another great theologian, Gladys Knight, had a song back in the 70s. That's 1970s for those of you that are, yeah. And it's interesting. The song that she wrote um, involved, uh, well, it's not the song she wrote, sorry. It was written for her. But the songwriter that wrote it actually got the information uh, and the inspiration from a phone call with Farrah Fawcett and Lee Majors. And for some of you that know those names, uh, it's kind of cool. For those of you that don't, Wikipedia. <laughs> but I guess at the time, one of them was trying to make it big in Hollywood, and it wasn't working. They were trying to make it in a football team, and it, was, it went to the pros and didn't pan out as well as it did, and they decided they'd go back. And what we got from it was the midnight train to Georgia. And here's the first lines of that song. It says, L.A. proved too much for the man, so he's leaving a life to come, uh, he's come to know. He said he's going back to find that what's left of his world, the world he left behind not so long ago. He's leaving. On a midnight train to Georgia. And that's enough of that one. <laughs> said he's going back to a simpler place and time. See, he wanted to get the first train out of town becomes, I'm longing to go back. I'm looking to go back. Now, the youngest son was coming back, but the truth was he was coming back different, wasn't he? He was the same physical body, maybe a little bit skinnier, maybe a little bit dirtier, but he came back, he, he came back in the same DNA, he came back in the same body, but he was definitely different when he came back, wasn't he? And when he came back, 
This is what I want you to see from the gospel in Luke 15. This is the truth of the gospel. The son was welcomed back. The relationship was restored. And there was a great celebration because of it. Think about that. I don't know if I'm welcome back. I don't know. Maybe I could earn it back, whatever. And he is hit with the compassion of the Father. So many people in this world do not see the compassion of God the Father. They see the justice of God the Father. They see the strictness of God the Father. And they miss out on the compassion of God the Father, who welcomes back those that have wandered off because of their own deeds, not because someone else tricked them. He welcomes them back no matter what the reason is that they found themselves in the situation that they are. He says, come home, welcome home, and he runs to meet them. We are ambassadors of this kingdom. We are ambassadors of this God. This account isn't about getting someone to come back to church either. It's far deeper than that. This fall, we're going to actually be doing a series here and um, I've come up with it, and we're going to call it, What If Coming to Church Was Like Coming to Jesus? Um, the truth is, the great majority of our community has not known a good, healthy gospel church. They have not had experiences in it. Uh, the media is portraying all Christians as being heartless, ruthless murderers because of what's happening in our world today. And uh, we have an opportunity to rather than hide and, and shelter ourselves from the world around us, instead to be ambassadors of what Jesus says his Father desires for the world that has made whatever decisions they have made. And I want to pause and just remind all y'all, including those of you at home, um, what this building is for. Uh, we are to be home for those who feel like they don't deserve to come home. You get that? We are to be a home for people that feel like they don't deserve to come home. They, uh, we exist for the people that think they're too far from God. And yes, as Christians, those of you that are, have a faith in Jesus Christ, yes, we grow and are discipled, but we can't remember first and foremost that we are a home uh, more than a temple. We're, we're a living room rather than a courthouse. And in knowing that, uh, it affects how we interact, how we love, and how we can approach others as they enter and how we approach one another as we come in to this place. And then at the end of this story, I, I wish it was done with the party, but it's not. There's the older brother and, and the tension with the older brother. The one that I have been with you, Father, all the time. I've done everything you've said. I have kept what you wanted me to do. I have been obedient. I have been obedient. And therefore, I deserve whatever. It's hard. Because Jesus tells us that the Father desires relationship over hard work. So you've done everything exactly, and you've exhausted yourself, but you've missed the idea that there is a relationship. I am not your employer, I am your father. And I so want you to have that relationship with me. We have to be careful that we, just like we can be the prodigal son, we can also be the proudful older brother. Because really, we don't like change, and somebody else coming back, that messes up all of their plans. Somebody, somebody new has come in, oh no, I have to divide, I have to share, I have to work through things. Uh, it's not going to be exactly the way I want it. It's going to be different. And we can get intimidated and haughty. One of the things that we see is in the high schools right now. There will be a bunch of kids coming in uh, into, I believe it's grade 9 this year, when they transition to high school. And uh, they're going to find out in that very first week, oh, we can't sit here. This is this person's cafeteria table. Oh, we can't have that locker because that's where that person, right? Right? Because I've been here, you little freshman, 
you fall into the place where you're supposed to be. Take your position. God the Father says to the haughty, high-level-up senior, cool down, calm down. Y'all are equal. Love one another. Don't think you're more high than someone else. <gasps> but they sat in my pew. It's not your pew. Guess what? It's not your church. <gasps> it's his church. We just get the enjoyment of living in it and sharing, enjoying, right? Now, fortunately, I have not had that issue here. And I've been here 13 years, and I have not had that issue here ever. And I'm not going to, am I? <laughs> right. Good. But even for those, even that if it affects your, your comf it makes you uncomfortable and, and you have to share and you don't get what you deserve, please hear the plead of the Father to come and join the party. We need to be excited when someone comes home. That's our most important thing. When the person comes in that hasn't been here before, it's the, oh, I wonder who that is. It's the, oh, Welcome home. You're home. We are going to celebrate that you're here. Right? That might shift a whole lot of different thinking. But you know what? That's what God's living room looks like. That's what the Father's living room looks like. So, hear this gospel and share it. Jesus has come for those who have messed up, done what seems to be unforgivable things to welcome them into a life-giving connection. He's waiting. He's waiting for them. He's waiting for you at the train station to get you back on track. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the gospel that is extended to everyone. Help us to learn from the words that you teach, for we know there is depth beyond depth in your word. There are multi-layers to the meanings, and they hit our souls at different times in different parts of our lives. And Lord, we pray today for those that are watching online and for those that are here physically, we pray that they would remember the gospel message. Remember that uh, even though they are drawn away from you, that they can come back. And they can come back not in a different way, not in a lesser way, but they can come back into your compassion and your love and your celebration, and they can experience fullness of life again in you. Lord, help us to reflect the Father. Help us to be a people that welcomes in and draws in and, and waits for and runs with compassion to those that make a move towards you. Help us, Lord, to, to celebrate with all we have in the true treasure in this world, a soul that has come back to you. And Lord, help us to always be aware and help us to judge ourselves so that we never become the older brother that is so focused on, on what we're going to earn and what we're going to get because we've done everything right that we have no room left to celebrate and rejoice with those that have been joining and into a relationship with you and joining your family. Lord, uh, help us to experience the joy of this parable. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.